Fast RCNN is fast, but it's not fast enough. Based on the experiments, we can see that fast RCNN takes around 2.3 seconds to detect objects inside an image. And if we just don't consider the time that the selective search module consumes, we see that all other modules spend only 0.32 seconds. So we have a problem, which is selective search is slow. So to mitigate the problem, we can just remove the selective search that we have and instead add a CNN module called RPN, which basically does the same thing. Now let's just see what's inside the RPN. Assuming that we have a beautiful car as an input image with a ground truth, let's see what our current model does. By the way, the reason why I say the spatial dimension is 600 by 600 is because in the paper they say that they resize the image such that the lowest dimension is 600. So one of width or height should be 600 and the other could be larger. Anyway, we have our image and our ground truth as input, and we pass them through our model. After passing the first max pool, the spatial dimension would be 300 by 300, then 150 by 150, then 75 by 75, and finally 37 by 37, which means that it's like that we just separated our input image into 37 by 37 grid structure. But for the sake of the demonstration, let's just say the grid size is 8 by 8. The thing they do inside RPN is that they pass it through a 3 by 3 conv layer just to increase the receptive field size. And then they pass it through a 1 by 1 conv layer that for now, let's say our output channel dimension is 2. But why 2? Because they use something called anchor box, which is a fixed size window, such as what we can see here, and those two channel dimensions should say either there is an object inside this anchor box or not. And we can place this anchor box at every possible position that we have in our grid structure. So, for every anchor box, such as this, we produce a two-dimensional vector, which is equal to the number of output channels, and we pass it through a softmax just to see which entry has the highest probability. For example, the first entry corresponds to the probability of being an object inside the anchor box, and the second entry is the opposite of that. But, as we can see, this anchor box cannot cover the whole area around the car. So, we need to do something so that we just modify the anchor box just a little bit, such that it covers the car the best. And for doing it, we just need to add another 1x1 one one conv layer that produces 4 channels. 2 channels for X and Y, and another 2 for width and height. But in practice, one anchor box is not enough, and we usually use nine anchor boxes with different sizes and different aspect ratios. So instead of having those two conv layers that we just have, we will use these conv layers that one has 2K channels and the other has 4K channels. And that's the whole general idea. From now on, we will be more specific by understanding what is the loss function for RPN and how can we train such a model. The loss function for RPN has this formula. It is a multitask loss because we have to compute a loss for classification, which is just being an object or not, and regression for the modification of the anchor box to cover the object. And as we can see here for the regression loss, we have Ti and Ti star. Ti is the output of our model, which says how much we should modify the x and y and width and height. And Ti star is the ground truth. The formula for Ti is the same as what we had in the previous versions, so I'm not going to talk about that. But for classification, 
Here, PI is the RPN output that says whether there is an object inside the anchor box or not. And PI star is our ground truth that says whether there is an object in that particular area or not. And here, the first term seems easy because it's something that we usually deal with it. But if we just consider the second term, we will see that there is a P star behind this regression loss. And that basically means that we only apply regression loss if there is an object in this area. Because if there is an object, then P i star is 1 and otherwise is 0. And if it is 0, then it means that we don't care about the regression loss anymore. But when is it 1? That's a good question. According to the paper, it is 1 if the intersection over union between our anchor and the real object in the image is more than 0 0.7. And it is 0 if the intersection over union is less than 0 0.3. So what about the ones in the range between 0 0.3 and 0 0.7? We just ignore them and we don't consider them for our loss. And what if, if we don't have any anchor that has IOU more than 0 0.7? Because in such cases, we just train with false prediction. And no matter how our final prediction becomes closer to the object, we still say we don't care about it because it is still below 0 0.7. And we don't encourage our model to become closer to the object. And so we don't actually converge to a better model. So, to solve this problem, the authors propose to have an OR statement here and say, in such cases, we consider the anchors with highest IOU as our true positives. But uh, how many anchors does our model produce? Assuming that our model before RPN produces a feature map such that its spatial size is 60 by 40, then the total number of positions would be 60 times 40, which is 2400. And these are the positions. And in every position, we have k anchors, meaning that we have 2400 times k anchors, which is a lot. Of course, we do not have that many objects inside the image. So this arises a challenge. And the challenge is that considering our predictions, it is usual to have many, many wrong predictions and a few correct predictions because, as I mentioned earlier, we can't have around 20 thousands of objects inside an image, right? I mean, 20 thousands is just 2400 times k in case k is 9. I mean, it's around 20 thousands. But anyway, so we have a problem of imbalanced data during the training which is usually problematic in machine learning. So to solve this problem, the others propose just to sample a subset of them in a way that the distribution is balanced. The batch size of the, our sampling is usually 256, which means that we need 128 positive predictions and 128 negative ones. Remember, 128 doesn't necessarily mean that we have 128 objects inside an image because we might have multiple anchors that have an IOU more than 0 0.7 with an object. But in case that we have fewer positive predictions, such as 7D, then we have to have more negative samples. I mean, we don't have any other choice, do we? Okay. So now let's just talk about how do we learn our model. It's actually more challenging than what it seems because remember that the fully connected layers and the softmax modules at the end are responsible for our final prediction. And the result depends on the RPN module that proposes the possible regions. In fast RCNN, it was the responsibility of selective search to do that. And during training, it was always giving us a firm decision that where are the possible regions because it was an external algorithm and it wasn't changing during the training. It was always the same. 
but now the problem is that RPN should be learned as well. So it cannot give us a firm decision at first, which negatively affects the ultimate prediction and makes the training challenging. So to solve this problem, the authors proposed that we can do the training in multi-steps by initializing two separate networks at first, one for RPN, and the other is the similar to fast RCNN that we have on the left. So in the first step, we have to train the RPN. And the way we do this is that we just initialize the backbone VGG using ImageNet and train the RPN module to have a firm decision. But doing this causes the backbone weights to be changed as well, which might not be a good thing because for detecting either there is an object or not, the backbone might forget features that are useful for classification. So in the second step, we just throw the RPM backbone away and initialize the backbone of fast RCNN with ImageNet weights. And in this step, RPN acts like a selective search, and it is considered as an external network that its weight wouldn't be updated throughout the learning. It's exactly like the training of fast RCNN, which instead of selective search, now we have RPN. And in third step, we train the RPN again to propose better regions. But wouldn't backbone weights be negatively affected now? Actually, for current training, they propose to make backbone weights freeze and only train RPN module, something that we also do in transfer learning. So it wouldn't be any problem. And for the final step, we just need to freeze the backbone and RPN module and only train the fully connected layers. And yeah, that was all the things you needed to know from Faster or CNN. If you found this video useful, don't forget to like and subscribe.